Hey guys, welcome back to session two of how to walk without falling or stumbling. We looked at a lot of scripture in the first one, uh, the first session, and it, it tells you that you're going to overcome the wicked one, that if you add to your faith, the wicked one can't touch you, all those different things. Um, and it tells you that you're not going to fall. It, it's amazing. If, if people could just live by that. Um, now, I, again, if you do fall, that's what grace is about. You know, it, it's about learning how to walk this thing out. It's a process, it is. But the process happens uh, at our pace. Not at God's pace, at our pace. God is not in control of the process. We are in control of the process. Uh, and our spiritual life is really determined on how much we put into it. How much are you dil diligently seeking the Lord? Okay? Now, it's not a before anybody jumps on me, it's not a performance-based Christianity, but how much are you seeking the Lord? Because the Bible clearly says that God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. Okay? Now, we're going to pick this up. So we, we, on the last session, we ended with 1 John 2, 9 through 11, 1 John 2, uh, 13 and 14. And then now we're going to pick right back up with Matthew 7, 24 through 27. This is a key, okay? This is, this is, this is a really key part of Scripture. All Scripture is key, but, you know, the certain parts that are like, okay, if I get this, I'm solid. Matthew 7, verse 24. Therefore... Whosoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, that's the key. Focus on that, does them. Whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, okay? I really emphasize that, right? Maybe even write that down, does them in big, in big letters, because that's the key. I will liken him, so this is Jesus talking. So whoever hears the sayings of mine, Jesus said, and does them, I will liken him unto a wise man, which built his house upon a rock. Okay? Does them. Jesus says you're a wise man and you, because you built your house upon a rock. And the rains descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house, the person, let's say, and it fell not. How to walk without falling. Do the word of God. That's what it says, Right? If you do it, you'll be a wise man. Your house is built upon a rock. When the floods come, the winds come, because you've done the word. And if you're doing the word, it's because you understand the word. You're not going to do it without some sort of a degree of understanding. So this is saying that if you do the word, if you're understanding the word, when the rains and the wind and the flood and all the storms of life come your way, you'll fall not. Do you see that? That's another promise. Back in the, in the first session, we talked about falling not and what the Bible promises about falling not. This is what Jesus Christ himself said. If you do these things, you won't fall. It's amazing. Then he says, uh, for it, because it was founded upon the rock. Well, who's the rock? Jesus is the rock, right? The, 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 not, not Peter. Like people say, well, Peter's the rock because, you know, Jesus was talking to Peter and all that about the rock. Jesus, the revelation, because Peter had the revelation, he said, I will build this, my church upon this rock. What? The revelation that Jesus is the Messiah, that he is the Christ. Okay? So, if you do the word of God, when all this stuff comes, you're not going to fall because your house was built upon the rock, the revelation of Jesus Christ and the word of God. Right? But let's go on. Verse 26. And everyone that hears these sayings of mine, so same thing, They've both heard the word of God and, and, uh, and does them not. So here's two categories of people. Obviously, these are people that are listening to the word of God or hearing the word of God um, because it talks about uh, they're hearing the word, right? So people are hearing the word and one's a doer, like James said, be a doer of the word, not just a hearer or else you're deceiving yourself. This is exactly what this is talking about. If you hear these things of mine and don't, do them. You shall be likened unto a foolish man. Well, some people say, well, you should never, you know, you should use language like fools or whatever. If you don't do in the word of God, you are a fool. That's what the Bible says. 
right? Now, of course, we don't want to go around calling people fools, but anybody who doesn't live by the word of God is a foolish person because this is what's real and it's true. This is why we're seeing the things in the world because the world doesn't believe in the word of God, right? So if they did, we'd have a whole different place, but that's for another day. This says, if you don't do them, you'll be a foolish man, which house was built upon the sand. And the rains descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon the house, and it fell. And great was the fall of it. What's the difference? Being a hearer and a doer. This is why it's in the Bible several times in different ways. Hearing it and doing it. That's the key to not falling. If you do the Word of God, you're not going to have time for all these other things. When you don't do the Word of God, you're going to have a lot of time on your hands, and time is a killer. Idle time is a killer for Christians. Your mind's going to start wandering, the devil's going to come in, and all these different things, and you're going to fall. If you do the Word of God, you will not fall. That's another one of those precious promises we talked about in session one. That's, a, that's amazing, you know? Um, it, it, it sure is a lot different than... Well, you know, you never know. You're going you're gonna to fall and, and uh, you know, times are tough and you're in the valley and God's got you in a season in the valley. I don't see that in scripture. But anyway, don't fall. Do the word of God. Let's move on. Mark chapter 4, verse 13 through 20. And he said unto them, Know ye not this parable? So we know this that Jesus had just been talking to them about the, the sower going out and sowing the word. And, and they had no idea. The, the disciples were, what? What are you talking about? And he says, listen, uh, well, he says right here in verse 13, and he said unto them, know ye not this parable? Then how are you going to know the rest of the parables? Because Jesus talked about parables and he said, listen, let him has an ear who hear, let him hear it, right? So he's saying, how are you going to know this? I talk in parables, I speak in parables, I give examples. How are you going to know this? Like, are you guys daft? This is basically what he's saying here. Um, know ye not this parable? Like, I don't think Jesus was like, well, you don't know the parable? Well, that's, that's okay you know that's that's no problem i think he was like don't you know like are you guys really that daft that you don't know this parable like how do you not know what i'm saying you know you know i'm the messiah yet you don't know this anyway the sower sows the word and these are by the wayside which the word is sown but when they have heard satan comes immediately and takes away the word that was sown in their hearts okay so we're not going to cover all of this, I just, but I want to get to this point. Satan comes immediately to steal the word that was sown. Well, you know, um, you know, you teach on healing and somebody's like, oh, I got this pain in my side. You know, Satan's trying to come in and, and, and steal the word that was sown in their hearts, right? They start to believe it and Satan's like, no, 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 I can't have that. This is why, well, we'll go on and read what it says, but this is why you've got to have that strength, that grit and determination and have the word of God in you. So no matter what, nobody can come and steal that from you. Not anybody could come and take that from you. If it's deep in your soul, if it's right in your heart, if you've got it, well, we'll see here, rooted in yourself, nobody can come and pluck that from you. That's where you have to get, you have to be bound and determined to never be shaken off the word of God. And sometimes that takes a little bit of aggressiveness to, to, to get a hold of that. And then, and then the violent take it by force, right? So sometimes we got to get a hold of that and not be so passive and, 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 you know, just live in an apathy and no, we got to get strong and bold in the word of God and the things of, of God. So Satan comes and he steals what was sown in their hearts immediately. And these are likewise the ones that are sown on stony ground. So he's given, there's four different categories of people. We're only going to cover a couple of them for, for time's sake, but it says um, they're sown on stony ground who then have heard the word immediately receive it with gladness. So these are the people you see, um, you know, in church or something like that. And they, they receive the word of God with gladness and they're just super, Oh, what a great word of God. My life is, my life is completely changed. And, and, and I mean, it's just amazing to me and, and all that kind of stuff. But look what it says and have no root in themselves. So endure for a time afterward, when affliction or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they are offended, which means to stumble or to fall. Okay? So they hear the word of God. They're absolutely set on fire. They love it. That's great. Woohoo! Great. Wonderful. They leave the church the next day, the next day after that. They have no root in themselves. What does that mean? It was emotion. 
and unfortunately we serve an emotions-based Christianity. They have no root in themselves, right? Um, again, on YouTube, we have a teaching called um, How Deep Is Your Root System, I believe. And that goes into the stuff about how deep your roots go. And if you're a strong tree, big, tall, strong tree, where the wind doesn't blow you around, it's because you have deep roots, okay? Not wide roots spread out only an inch deep, but deep roots that go way down. Um, so when that wind comes, you're not tossed to and fro because you have a root in yourself. So this says... You have no root in themselves, so they endure for a time, whether that's a day, whether that's a week, whether that's a month. But afterward, when affliction or persecution comes, and we know we're going to be persecuted because that's what Jesus said, arises for the word's sake. So that means that somebody at some time, one of these people said something about Jesus. Oh, you should have heard what I heard in church. It really impacted me. And they said, you're a churchgoer? Or something of that nature. And for the word's sake. So we know that they were confessing the word somehow because it says that persecution or affliction comes because of the word's sake so we know that they were speaking it saying something about the christ saying something about you know christianity or something like that um and when that person a persecution came immediately they're offended stumble or fall why because they had no root in themselves they were emotion-based christians just having itchy ears they didn't have a root within themselves. Beloved, if you don't have a root in yourself, you're going to fall. You're going to stumble. You're going to fall. But when persecution or affliction arises because of the word's sake, and it will, not maybe, it will. If you have a root in yourself, you will not get offended. You will not fall. You will not stumble. Hallelujah. It's, it's, it's amazing. Verse 18. And these are they which are sown among the thorns. I, I guess we'll go on and, and read a few of the rest here. These are which are sown among the thorns, such as hear the word. See, it's about the word. It's always about the word of God. And the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches. It's not the riches. It's the deceitfulness of riches. I got to go after it. I need more. I have to get more. It's not enough. I've got to step on people. I got to rip off people. I got to hurt people. I have to manipulate people to gain power, to gain riches. That is the problem. Okay, the deceitfulness of riches and the lust of other things entering in. A lust can be anything. A lust can be a strong desire for anything. Okay, now there is you can you can even desire the things of God, and you can you can lust after good things almost. Okay, but it can never go to the place where you're just seeking that thing no matter what, unless. It's the truth of the word of God, the spirit of God, something of that nature that you want a truth from God. You want some, some wisdom of God, something that's what something you can, you can get a hold of. But this is talking about money and the deceitfulness of the riches. It's not the riches. God doesn't want you poor and poverish because how are you going to fulfill being a cheerful giver if God wants you poor and poverish? And he said, all these other lusts, they come in, they choke the word. See again, it's about the word. And it becomes unfruitful in your life. When it chokes out, it'll become unfruitful in your life. When the word of God is choked out, it'll become unfruitful. Why? Because you've gone after the lusts of other things. You're going after the deceitfulness of riches. Okay? And it's going to choke that thing out. Then verse 20, it says, And these are they are, that are sown on good ground. So first of all, you want to be good ground. What kind of a soil are you? We have a teaching on YouTube again. Um, called what kind of a soil are you such as hear the word again it's about the word the word the word the word the word and receive it and bring forth fruit some 30 fold some 60 and some 100 okay now there's like i said there's four types of category or the four types of people here there's four categories of people the first three bore no fruit none whatsoever the fruit that is talking about the 30 60 and 100 fold are the last court category that was sown into good ground. They were good ground. The word of God was sown into good ground. They heard the word and they received it. They understood it. Those are the ones that had 30, 60, 100 fold. The other three, nada, nothing. And the Bible's clear and says, if you don't bear fruit, you'll be cast out, chopped down, hewn down and thrown into the fire. We need to bear fruit. But you're going to be offended if you don't have a root in yourself. Knowing the word of God, bearing fruit are ways to stop you from falling. 
to walk without stumbling or falling. Now we're going to go to 1 Timothy 6, 6, uh, 6 through 10. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. Having food and clothing, raiment, let us therefore be content. But if they that be rich fall into temptation. Now some people look at that and say, you see, if you're going to be rich, you're going to fall into temptation. That's not true. Though, just like we read, those who are seeking it and the deceitfulness of riches, they're going to fall into temptation. If, if being rich in the Bible is, is wrong, then what do we do with King Solomon? What do, we do, what do we do with David? How about the at the disciples, the apostles' feet? People in Acts were throwing gold and silver at their feet. Okay? Um, listen, it's, it's not having things. It's the things having you. This says if you're seeking after being rich, you're going to fall into temptation. Why? It's a snare and into many foolish hurts and lust. Why? Because men drown in destruction and perdition. Because they're seeking after that thing. They're stepping away from the Lord and money becomes their God. And the Bible says you can't serve money or mammon and God at the same time. This is talking about somebody where money or success has become their God. And they they fell into many foolish hurts and lusts. And they drown in destruction and perdition. So it's not the money. It's the love of it. Which we'll see in a second. Well, next verse, as a matter of fact. For the love of money is the root of all evil. See, it does not say, for money is the root of all evil. Some people say it like that. I had a conversation with somebody that I know, and they said, you know, money's the root of all evil. Um, and I said, no, the love of money is the root of all evil. He said, well, if you want to put it that way. And I said, well, I'll put it the way the Bible says it. It's the love of money, the lust of money, really. Um, that's the root of all evil. Why? Because you can never have enough. That's why you step on people. That's why you hurt people. That's why you manipulate people. That's why greed steps in. That's why all these things are so wrong because it's hurting people to, for self-gain, right? And the Bible says, what does it do good for a man to gain the whole world and lose his own soul? We're seeing a lot of that today. Then it says, for the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some converted after have erred from the faith. Wait a minute. I thought once saved, always saved. Now nah, we're going to be bringing a teaching on that. There's far too much evidence in scripture where people are drawn back. They, they pull back. They err from the faith. Um, and it says, and they've pierced themselves through many sorrows. So because of the love of money, they're going after it. They coveted. See, while some coveted after money that's what it's taught it doesn't say because people had money they've erred from the faith no they coveted after money they've erred from the faith and they pierced themselves you see that they have pierced themselves why because they're choosing to fall and go after these things because they're not being rooted in the truth of the word of god they're not doing the bible they're not adding to their faith all these things that we talked about from second peter that's what's happening and they start to chase after money and that's the world system and Satan comes in and, and destroys their life and they themselves pierce themselves. 2 Timothy 1.6 Wherefore, I put thee in remembrance that you should stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. So Paul was saying to Timothy, listen, stir up this gift that's in you. Don't relent. Keep going. Fight the good fight of faith as he said. He said, I fought the good fight of faith. I finished my course. But here's another way to not fall, to walk without falling, is to stir up that gift of God inside you. Not that the Holy Spirit needs stirring up, it's that we need stirring up, and we stir up that thing inside us to keep ourselves sort of motivated and sharp, if you will, in the gift of the Lord, the Holy Spirit. So stir up that gift. Keep that gift in you, the gift of the Holy Spirit, stirred up on a regular basis, um, then you're going to actually keep doing the Word and you're not going to fall. 1 John 5.18 we know that whoever is born of God, so talking about Christians, sins not. This doesn't mean you can't sin or have a mistake. What this means is you're not going to habitually sin. You're not going to live in willful, habitual sin. But that he is begotten of God, keeps himself, and the wicked one touches him not. So there's another promise that the wicked one can't touch you. If what? You keep yourself out of willful, habitual sin. If you keep yourself out of willful, habitual sin, you will not stumble and you will not fall and you will walk without falling. It's amazing. These are all promises of, of God and they're just incredible. We're going to finish up here. We're going to finish this teaching here. John 15, 1 through 16. So all of John chapter 15, 
right into uh, chapter 16 and 1. Jesus said, I am the true vine, and my Father is the husbandman. You have to get this whole chunk of scripture in you. Every branch in me, so in him, talking about what? Christians. That bears not fruit, he is taken away, and every branch that bears fruit, he purges it, that it might bring forth more fruit. What does that mean? He prunes it. He takes away things. See, when, when God purges something, it's not talking about him coming in there with a whip or a cane and beating us half to death or, you know, just laying a whooping on us. It's not talking about that. It's, it's purging you and taking things out of your life that are contrary to the word of God. So he's helping you renew your mind to the word of God. He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And when you start seeking him out, he's purging you and saying, you know what? I don't need those thoughts anymore. Or I don't need that language anymore. I don't need that friend anymore. I don't, you know, some, some of us need to be purged of some friends that you just don't need. Uh, maybe even some family members too. But God, will, God wants to take all the negative things out of your life. But it's us who sort of holds on to those things. That he purges you to bring, break, uh, bring forth more fruit. You are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me and I in you. That's the key, that abiding in. If he says abide in me, that means you can be a Christian without abiding in him, okay? And I abide in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can you, except you abide in me. So you can't bear fruit on your own, is what this is saying. You've got to abide in him. I am the vine, and you are the branches. He that abides in me, and I in him, the same bring forth much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered and men gather them and cast them into a fire and they are burned. That's what the Bible says. That's what Jesus said. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will and it shall be done. Stop there. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. Well, you know, God's not answering my prayers. God doesn't answer prayers. Um, really? Are you abiding in him and are his words abiding in you? Because it clearly says if you're abiding in him and his word is abiding, living and active in you, you shall ask what you will and it shall be done. That is a promise. It doesn't say I'll think about it. It doesn't say I'll go to my father. It doesn't say I'll check God's day timer and see if he's in a good mood that day. It says if you abide in me and my word is alive and active in you, you'll ask what you will and it'll be done for you. That's, a, that's an amazing promise. Here in verse 8, here is my God, the Father glorified that you may bear much fruit. You want to glorify God? Bear fruit in your life. So you shall be my disciples. If you bear fruit, you glorify God and you get to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. But just because you believe in him does not make you a disciple. Okay? As my Father has loved me, so I loved you. Continue ye in my love. So continue in my love, which means what? You can not continue in his love as well. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love. So it's telling you, how do you abide in the love of Jesus? By keeping his commandments. Do you see that? See, there's a whole wrong teaching on this thing, which we're going to get into one day. But it says, if you want to abide in my love, if you want to, if you want to keep walking in my love, keep my commandments. So if you're not doing the commandments, are you abiding in his love? Even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. So how did Jesus keep in the Father's love? By doing His commandments. These things I have spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you. My joy is in you, He said. Okay? And that your joy might be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no man than this, that, that a man lay down his wife for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. So what if you're not doing what he's commanded, are you his friends? Jesus said, if you do what I command you to do, then you are my friend. This is the words of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Henceforth, I call you not servants, for the servant knows not what his Lord does, but I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made known unto you. Oh, but God is mysterious. Um, Jesus said, listen, uh, all things that I've heard of my Father, I have made known unto you. Why? Because he put us his spirit into us and the spirit knows all things and we have the word of God as well. well again, we have a, a teaching on YouTube called God is God Mysterious. I encourage you to watch it if you think God is mysterious because I assure you he is not. Verse 16. 
You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. And I've ordained you that you should go bring forth fruit. So he's ordained, ordained us to go bring forth fruit, not just to sit in a church and, 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 and claim to be saved and, and, you know, where I'm a good Christian because I have good church attendance. No, he's ordained you to go bear fruit, guys. This is what we need to do. Why? That your fruit should remain, that whoever shall ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Again, bearing fruit, abiding. If you need something from the Father, ask and he'll give it to you. But there's a condition behind abiding and bearing fruit. Do you see that? These things I command you, that you love one another. If the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. If you are of the world, the world would love his own. But because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. So don't despise if you're hated by the world. If you're living for the word of God, don't despise it. Actually rejoice in it. But, but unfortunately, so many people deal with rejection that if somebody comes against them, they take it personally. No, Jesus said if they come against you, it's because they're coming against me. And therefore we don't need to take it personally. Remember the word I said to you, verse 20. The servant is not greater than his Lord. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. So if, 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 if they're going to um, persecute you, it's because they're persecuting Jesus. Um, and if you keep the sayings, they will also keep yours, yours as well. So we got to keep the word of God moving forward. And they're going to keep that word as well. But all these things will they do unto you for my name's sake, because they know not him that sent me. If I had not come and spoken unto them, they had, a not, they had not had sin. But now they have no cloak for their sin. Why? Because Jesus came to reveal it, right? And he, he, he went to them and he said, you guys are you sinners, you need, to, you need to change. You know, he's talking to the Pharisees and things like that. Jesus came to become sin for us. Now they don't have a cloak for it. Now they can't hide behind it. Because God knows, right? Verse 23. And he that hates me uh, hateth my father also. Yeah, it's a bad place to be, guys, if you hate God. If I had not done them the works which none other man did, they had not had sin. But now they both seen and hated both me and my father. People will hate you for what you do for the Lord. Why? Because they hated Jesus. And if they hate you, see, we're so closely united with, with Christ that if, if people hate you, they're hating the Father. They're hating God himself if they hate you. Anyway, but this comes to pass, that the word might be fulfilled that is written in their law, they hated me without a cause. And the, word, the world's going to hate you without a cause too. Uh, don't give them a cause to hate you though. But when the comforters come, the Holy Spirit, when whom I will send uh, from uh, unto you from the Father, sorry, even the spirit of truth, which proceeds from the father, he shall testify of me and you shall bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. Now I read all that to get to this one line because you have to understand how this works. Verse or, or, chapter 16, verse one. Now remember, there's no, there's no chapter and verse in the Bible. It was not written in chapter and verse. Okay. So this is all con a continuous letter. These things, the continuous sayings by Jesus, these things I have spoken unto you that you should not be offended. Okay. So he spoke all this fruit bearing, all this abiding, walk in my love, serve me. Um, you know, we're supposed to shun evil and do all these different things. Why? Because you shall not be offended or stumble or fall. If you abide in him, and his word, and he abides in you, and you abide in his word, you shall not fall. If you're busy doing the word, if you are walking by faith, if you are in the word of God, if you're diligently seeking, if you're doing the word, you shall not fall. Several promises. We're gonna we're gonna end here, but several times in this in this these chunks of scripture that I looked at that we brought out. It says, you shall not be offended. You shall not fall. You shall not stumble. So it is possible to live a, a life of walking out faith without falling. But honestly, I don't know anybody who's done that except for Christ. Um, but it's something to, to strive for. It's something to aspire to. Why? Because it's biblical. If it's biblical, we should be, we should be going for it, right? Um, 
I'm not saying it's going to be easy because that's what dying to self is, is really, you know, moving forward, laying down our lives, standing strong, be, having a root in ourselves, adding to your faith, walking this thing out, getting strong in the Lord. So when those winds come and you're doing the word, you're not going to be shaken. And if you're abiding in him and him in you, and, and this word is abiding in you as well, and it's all abounding, you shall not fall. So guys, listen, thank you for listening to these two parts. Um, I, had, I had a joy um, preaching this because I never really looked into this thing, how to walk without falling um, before. I've, I've never really looked at it. Um, I know what it means to, you know, to walk strong in the Lord and all that kind of stuff, but to walk without falling and what the Bible says specifically about falling or stumbling or whatever. Um, I hope this helped you. Um, do the word, abide in him, him and you have a root within yourself, be strong in the Lord, immovable, um, just solid in the word of God and you shall not fall. But we need to get away from the, the roller coaster, fall down, pick up, fall down, right, left, all that stuff. We need to get away from that. So God bless you guys. Thank you for tuning in. Let's learn how to walk without falling or stumbling. Because when you fall and stumble, people notice and they say, well, I don't know if I want what they have. So God bless you guys. Let's do an inventory of our life and let's walk without falling. God bless you guys. We'll see you next time.